Great. Yeah, so what I'm going to do really is uh, outline the process that led to a concept that we reviewed in February and then some of the comments that were made uh, during that meeting and where we stand now. So the, um, uh, as Brian pointed out, you know, what this is, this is a, a working group which is part of the task force which uh, sort of is, is mandated by the steering committee and then ultimately the goal is to then run a, a clinical trial um, through CTEP uh, with uh, hopefully um, some, some major impact on the disease uh, in question. And uh, the working group me members for the, the pre-surgical group that uh, we, uh, we headed up uh, are as follows. And Hyung Kim, uh, who's uh, not here today, I think, was, uh, was a co-lead with this. We had a, a medical oncologist and a surgeon uh, for this pre-surgical uh, working group. And we, again, tried to get a good representation of medical oncology, uh, urology, pathology, statistics. Uh, Judy Manola was our, our intrepid statistician in, in designing some, 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 uh, some constructs for us in this, uh, in this process. So um, our mandate was really to sort of take that pre-surgical concept and to design a clinical trial that would answer important questions uh, for the field of renal cell carcinoma. And uh, our, our mandate was to develop this clinical trial that really leveraged the pre-surgical approach to uh, either or improve our use of existing agents by understanding the interaction of that agent with the tumor microenvironment, and uh, also to identify determinants of response and resistance, and to prioritize novel agents by assessing uh, tissue and, and clinical response. So the advantage of the pre-surgical design is that one of the, the, the challenges that we face is we really don't have good biomarkers of much in renal cell carcinoma in 2013. And what we really need is we really need a certain amount of tissue. And you know the Gerlinger paper and other uh, ideas and concepts of, of tumor heterogeneity dictate that for us to really have something robust, we at this point in time really need to have a fair amount of tissue to achieve it. Uh, and these tissue endpoints are really rendered relevant by linking them to, to meaningful uh, clinical outcomes. And ideally, some of the original thoughts that we had were that a, a randomized design would really, again, add relevance to these, uh, to these endpoints. So when we think about how a drug interacts with, uh, with the, the tumor, we have to think of the tumor really as, as an organ that's, that's made up of the epithelial cell, the stromal cells, and the endothelial cells. And, and this is a very plastic uh, environment. You have the drug, it'll interface perhaps with the endothelium, which will modif be modified perhaps by the stroma, uh, and obviously the, the genomic determinants of the epithelium are going to modulate that as well. So it's very complex and really sort of thinking through the action and reaction, uh, again, requires a fair amount of, of tissue. And the other thing to, to sort of think about, and this is something that was illustrated when we were designing uh, the trials, is that on the, on the top right here, we have you know, hypothesis-based mechanistic considerations. You know, ideally, what you'd have is you'd have some sort of a laboratory observation um, which would generate a hypothesis, and you would then test that hypothesis in a, in a clinical study. But practical considerations come into play. Um, how many patients of a particular population do you have? Um, can you access drug A versus drug B? And so there's a practical overlay to, to anything that uh, you, you do here that ultimately results in, in your trial. It's you know, the, the, the sausage making of, of, of science. So as we went through this and we asked ourselves the questions, you know, what are the different d disease states? What are the different agents? Um, and what are the statistical designs that we would use to narrow down the, the, the type of trials we'd be interested in? The first question is, are we going to be doing a neoadjuvant study versus a metastatic patient study? Neoadjuvant meaning patients that have a primary tumor in place but don't have metastases, where we'd really be looking mainly at tissue endpoints. So we decided that so that we can have a clinical readout, we would be focusing on the metastatic patient population. The second question is, should we be learning the biomarkers and the biology of existing agents or novel agents. And at the end, you know, we figured that novelty would be good. We have new agents that are coming down the pipeline, and, and using this as a, as a means to, to learn something about the biology of both would be really important. 
The next question is, were we ready in 2012 and 2013 to power a clinical trial uh, by a biomarker as opposed to a clinical endpoint? And because we don't really have any validated candidate biomarkers that really you know, rise to that level, this by definition would have to be something that would be powered for a clinical out, um, an endpoint. And then in terms of response, is it primary response versus metastatic response? Obviously, we ultimately care about the metastases, um, but we make assumptions about the relationship between the primary and metastasis and hopefully get tissue from both. So the, uh, the next question then is, what are the most important questions we would want to answer from a, from a, a uh, uh, trial design perspective which, with regards to agents? And so one of the ideas that we had would be we would use a TKI, you know, sort of as a baseline, plus novel agents that might modulate TKI response and resistance, sort of a, a uh, first-past-the-post type of approach. The second was uh, with some preliminary data that Hyung Kim had generated, would it make sense to combine an mTOR inhibitor with PD-1 because it looks like paradoxically mTOR inhibitors might actually augment immune response. And the third idea would be TKI plus PD-1 um, antibody. And we, uh, we ended up saying that this third uh, choice would be the one that would be the most pragmatic and practical from, again, getting patients on trial perspective and, and also having the, really the, the the possibility for answering great scientific questions. We then moved into, um, and I don't have to tell you about checkpoint blocking uh, agents. You know, these are obviously very interesting. We don't know very much about who's benefiting, who should get these, how best to give them, and we thought this would be a great platform to design uh, trials. And so we came up with, ultimately because of Judy Manola's input, a randomized trial between PD-1 antibody versus TKI, asking the question of whether or not we can A, see whether or not there's differential clinical response between those two arms, B, are there any tissue factors that would actually guide us to which individuals were benefiting. And uh, we had the statistical design of 140 individuals, randomized 70 per arm, and uh, we would then be looking at the tissue with a number of different tissue endpoints. We had the meeting in Orlando in, in February 2013 where we discussed this in front of a, uh, a panel of our peers. And um, the, the ultimate thing was that it was defined really as a fishing, they, it was considered that this was too much of a fishing expedition. Yes, it's a clinical trial that you can do, but what's the question? And so the, um, the trial was then refined and redefined as being anti-PD-1 versus anti-PD-1 plus a VEGF receptor inhibitor. And this was based on the hypothesis that PD-1 inhibition um, would be good, but perhaps not sufficient. There are clinical data that VEGF receptor inhibitors modulate the microenvironment in a way that may augment the utility of, uh, of a drug like nivolumab. That, um, there are negative immunoregulatory cells that are depleted by anti-angiogenic therapy, that the combination will be superior to the, uh, the uh, PD-1 uh, antibody monotherapy alone, and that there would be things that we would be able to see in the tissue that would be able to guide us to that degree. Uh, there are a number of, of, of data that are out there that, that suggest that things like PD-1 ligand might be a potential biomarker, but it's in of itself probably not sufficient. And there are circulating data on myelide-derived suppressor cells that suggest that these are a cell population that may be modulated by drugs like sunitinib. So the trial was, um, as it stands, would be anti-PD-1 versus anti-PD-1 plus TKI, with the clinical objectives to explore whether anti-PD-1 antibody plus TKI provides superior response rate, progression-free survival compared to monotherapy that um, uh, the regulatory cell infiltrates um, are um, uh, portend for worse outcome and are modulated by these treatments, and whether or not PD-1 ligand um, is, is associated with and is modulated by um, the, uh, the drug. The thing with this is that we don't necessarily have preliminary data to be able to uh, power this at this point in time, and so at this moment what we're doing is we're developing, we're generating these preliminary data. So fortunately uh, at MD Anderson we have several pre-surgical studies. We have this Bevacizumab pre-surgical study, we have the Sunitna pre-surgical study, and also through the generosity of my collaborators uh, around the country and around the world, we have a number of other 
uh, sets of treated samples to be able to ask the question at preliminarily whether or not compared to untreated controls, we're seeing that antiangiogenic therapy is modulating these different types of cell populations. Um, we have TMAs of these. And in collaboration with a, a couple of uh, really great pathologists and an intrepid uh, um, instructor in my lab, uh, we're developing the infrastructure to be able to really look at this in a, in a uh, meaningful fashion. So um, the problem with immunohistochemistry is quantitation and doing this robustly. We're using the Vectra uh, multispectral imaging system, and this allows you to look quantitatively at your signal as well as segmenting cells and defining different cell subpopulations. Um, we can look, and you sort of look on the left, it's the unsegmented versus the right uh, segmented. The percentage of, of CD8 positive here, this looks like this is a, a very reasonable measure. Um, here's a higher percentage, it fits very nicely. Um, and we are also doing FOXP3. So these are single stains at this point in time, and we're in the process of moving to be able to do multiple antibodies so we can really define these subpopulations properly. Some interesting observations, we see that there are more CD4 positive cells in renal cell carcinoma compared to normal tissue. Uh, we see more CD8 positive cells. And intriguingly, initial data, not multiple antibody, we're seeing that sunitinib seems to raise the level, increase the level of FOXP3 cells in the tissue, which is counterintuitive. Um, so the plan really is to complete this tissue analysis to make sure that our hypotheses that we are using to design this clinical trial actually are, um, are, are validatable. Um, and the next step then will be to design, to power the trial and move forward. Thank you.